you guys and for all y'all we're fixing to talk about bedding plants, how to plant them, how to maintain them, that kind of thing. We've got two folks here to talk to you. Uh, the first one, Ellen, you going first or James? The first one will be Ellen Huckabee and the second one will be James Miles. These guys are regional extension agents just like Bo is. These two guys are out of the uh, Mobile office. Um, James is commercial horticulture. And Ellen is home horticulture, but they crisscross and cover more or less the same areas. Both very knowledgeable. They're going to do a really good talk for you. At the end of the at the end of the session, we'll have time for questions. Again, they do have a little microphone that's that's um, circling the room there. So if you got a question, raise your hand at the end. They'll give you the mic so that the other folks can know what your question is when we're done. All right, Ellen. All right, so mainly we're going to talk about annual bedding plants, but a lot of the same principles can be applied to perennial bedding plants, so more, more permanent plantings. Um, the general principle behind using annual bedding plants or perennials in the landscape is just to add color to the landscape, and especially with annuals, you can provide interest throughout the year instead of just having the same plants all the time. So trees and shrubs are great and wonderful and, and can be very attractive features in the urban landscape, but the annual plants and perennials, the ones that flower and bloom throughout the year, um, are the ones that really add dramatic color and interest to the landscape. And generally, um, they will cost less, of course, than your permanent plants. So especially annuals will have less cost. But there's also a higher labor cost associated with using a lot of annual bedding plants in an urban landscape because you have to be in there replacing them more often than you do your, your permanent plants. So you have to take those um, things into consideration. So traditionally, when we think about annuals in the landscape, we think about spring annuals and fall annuals. But with a little bit of careful planning and some thought put into it, we can have four seasons of flowering in an urban landscape. Um, I always think about, because I live here, I live there, has anybody been to Fairhope? That's kind of the, the prime example of um, having four seasons of annual plants in your landscape. Now, that is um, very controlled. They spend a lot of time and money on getting those plants into the same beds. So that may not be something that every city can do, uh, but that would be something to consider when you're planning your um, four seasons of annual plants in your landscape. So for early spring color, you're going to plant in February to March, and there's all kinds of bloom calendars out there that will give you lists of plants. So these are just a few examples, and you can look those up online to get ideas of uh, what types of plants you can use at these different times. For early summer color, you're going to plant tender annuals in the spring, so early to mid-April in this part of the state. And just some examples of those are geraniums, impatiens, rutabecchia. These are all plants that we're very familiar with, um, easy plants to do, but again, add color to your urban landscape. Just like Bo was saying, that um, in retail areas where they have trees and other uh, plant life, they take the retailers more seriously, people spend more money. Um, the annuals are a great way to add even more to that. Uh, in Fairhope, I know that during Mardi Gras, they will come in, take the plants out of the main public areas right before a parade, then go back in that night and put them back in so that the retailers are never without plants in front of their stores. Um, so it's very, they can be very labor intensive, but the payoff for it is very good because if you shopped in downtown Fairhope, you know that their prices are a little bit higher than if you shop outside of downtown or in Daphne or Mobile. For early fall color, um, you plant in late September to early October. Digitalis and Snapdragon are really the two main ones that you think about at this time. Um, it gets a little bit harder to find a large variety of plants for summer bloom times and then that late fall when it's still really hot and humid, but it can be done and we'll talk about uh, some of the plants that you can choose and some special situations that you may run into. And then for early winter, of course, we have pansies, snapdragons again, and petunias. So you put these in in late October to mid-November to have color through the winter and into the early spring. 
Now, the strategy behind having four seasons of bloom is that bloom times will overlap and they can vary. So you may not be able to use the same bed for your annual plants all the time. You may have different planting areas that are close so that visually you always have something in bloom, uh, but you may not be able to use the exact same area because you'll still have some plants blooming when it's time to install the others. Uh, another thing to consider that you may want to do for this is to not necessarily have an in-ground bed. You can have some raised planters, hanging baskets, things like that that you can put in um, like your early spring color while you still have your winter color in the ground maybe. Some difficult landscape situations that you may run into, um, a shaded wooded site uh, you want to use foliage and flower colors that stand out against the shade. So these are just some flowers and then also foliage colors that will stand out in a shaded area. Sunny, hot, and dry. This is probably the most common difficult situation we run into. Um, this would also be good for your summer bloom times. Um, even if these plants will, usually they can be brought back with by just watering them. Um, so they will survive in July and August, uh, and even in May, September, when we're still hot and dry here. Um, again, just a, a list of some that you may want to consider. There's all other kinds of lists out there that you may want to look into as well. Um, poor sandy soils can also be a, a landscaping challenge. And so you want to choose annuals that will stand up to drought and low fertility. So a lot of our native plants will uh, fall into this situation. Um, these again are annuals listed, but you can also look up perennials um, that you can use in these areas. Again, thinking about the native plants that are adapted to our growing conditions here. And then you may also have some tight clay soils, not heavily compacted, but that are just higher in clay than um, some of our coastal plain sandy soils. These can Im be improved by adding organic matter and tilling the soil, um, but you still want to look for plants that maybe tolerate a little bit um, more water, a little bit lower oxygen environments like sunflower or morning glory, some of those types of plants. Okay, so now that you know, uh, you've kind of got your ideas together about what types of plants you're going to use and you have your schedule planned out, then it's time to go out and, and lay out the planting bed. Um, it can be done very simply just using graph paper and simple tools. It doesn't have to be a fancy landscape architect's design. Um, just something generally so you know the space that you're working with to scale, the plants that you're going to use and make sure that when you draw those plants on your plan you're allowing enough space for each plant not only when you plant it but when it matures as well so you have to consider the grow in time. You want to group plants that have similar cultural and environmental requirements so you don't want to use something that has a high water content next to something that um, is drought tolerant because one is going to drown and one is going to uh, starve. You know, you're not going to be able to balance those. Also, you don't want to plant shade-loving with sun-loving plants. You have to consider um, what types of characteristics each plant has when you're grouping them together. Also, consider the foliage, flower, color, and texture, so you don't want to get too busy. Um, some variation in texture and color across a bed and in a landscape is desirable, uh, but you don't want things that clash heavily either, so take those things into consideration. Um, you can find a lot of this information just on the seed packet or the package that the plant comes in, so that's a valuable resource to have. Uh, then for your design, you want to put higher plants in the back, medium-sized plants in the, miller, in the middle, and spreading plants around the edges, so low-growing ground covers around the edges. Uh, make sure that you provide enough area for the plant, again, not only for the size it is when you install it, but for the size it's going to be when it grows. And that's where um, looking at the mature size of the plant really comes into play, too, because how many, just like Bo showed all the pictures of a tree under a power line, um, you can easily have a shrub growing up in front of a window and blocking a doorway 
or um, a window view in a building. So make sure you take into consideration the mature height of the plant and then consider planting in mass so you get a lot of bang for your buck. If you have two knockout roses, those are great and beautiful, but if you have 10 or 12 knockout roses, or I guess I should say 9 or 13 because you're supposed to do odd numbers in design, um, then you have a real visual impact uh, when you have more plants than just a couple. Okay, so this special situation, do y'all have any of these areas around Bruton where you have too steep of a slope to, to mow, so it's a dangerous situation um, to mow, not something that you want to have, so you install a planting bed, and be it perennials or annuals or whatever kind of uh, shrubs that you plant on this site, um, it's a really good idea to help mitigate a slope problem. It can reduce erosion because the plant roots will hold the soil there, um, and then when you put mulch around the plants too, that cuts down on erosion. Uh, does anybody see a problem with this design? What, well, watering could be an issue, so you might definitely want to consider some drought tolerant plants in this area where you only have to rely on rain. Uh, anything else? Do what? Erosion, but once you get the plants installed there, that's really, um, especially if you use some shrubs or some ground covers, junipers, things like that, they're really going to hold the soil there. Um, the main thing is if you're mowing this and you have to come in here and mow between the bed and the sidewalk, either you want to eliminate that whole grassy area down here or you want to make sure it's wide enough for your mowing equipment so that you don't have to get in there with a weed eater or either it becomes grassy and, and overgrown there. So just take into consideration all of the maintenance aspects of the area when you go, and not just design and, what, and the aesthetics of it when you go to put in your bed. Um, okay, so usually on a sheet of graph paper, one square will rep represent one square foot. So if your plant needs two square feet, then you need to allow two spaces in there when you are um, counting how many plants that you need. So go ahead and make sure you know how many plants and what plants you need uh, when you're planting out your beds. And just some tips for planting. Um, plant at the same level as your plants were in the container if you are getting transplants. So don't plant them deeper and don't plant them higher. You want to keep the roots at the same soil level that they were in the nursery. Um, when you are watering, you want to water it in slowly so that you don't wash away a lot of the, the soil um, and so that the water has time to infiltrate into the ground. Uh, to see how far down, how deep you've watered to make sure that you're watering the root zone, you, you need to dig down in the soil to check the depth of the water. Uh, put mulch on the surface to conserve water and prevent erosion. The first month or so of that plant being um, installed is the most critical time for it to become established. So you don't want to let it dry out. You don't want to let it get stressed um, from drought or uh, insects or disease as much as possible. So you ha may have to check and water it several times a week, particularly if it's a raised bed or a bed that you have um, brought a lot of topsoil material into to plant. Um, that can dry out faster than the native soil or planting in a large, uh, larger natural bed area. And remember that no plant will be drought tolerant until it becomes established. So even if it is labeled as drought tolerant, when you first plant it, you're going to have to add um, a lot of water and make sure that it really gets its roots down into the ground before it really is drought tolerant. Does anybody have any questions? All right, I'm going to turn it over to James to talk about some problems. Thank you. We're going to talk about a few common problems. First of all, we'll just add a couple of things to what Bob was saying about uh, plant selection. Uh, he talked about uh, uh, inspecting the root ball. Well, one of the things you want to do is also inspect the leaves, uh, the buds, and stems. Look for problems, you know, not just, you know, whether it's straight or, you know, that kind of thing, but also you want to look for insects, diseases. You know, there are so many things that you buy when you buy the plant. And if you can eliminate them when you purchase them, you know, you can cull those out. 
a lot of this stuff that we're going to show you, you know, is going to save you a lot of time and money. So look at it real close. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> one of the other things when it comes to coming to problems, if you'll get out there and look at these plants as often as you can, you know, whether it's in your own personal landscape, municipal landscape, you know, early morning, walk, coffee, tea, whatever you like to drink in the morning, it's a time to look for stuff. And as you're starting to prune and do and work, if you notice something unusual, that's the time to actually start, you know, doing a little research and letting folks know what's going on. Um, and getting, you know, getting control of these things or getting handled on these things, when you see one or two, it's much easier, you know, than when the population gets to be a thousand. You know, it, once, you know, some of these scale insects get to be a thousand and the trees eat up with it or plants eat up with it, you know, you're about cheaper to just replace it than to try to treat it, you know. So do a little scouting and uh, correctly identify it. If you don't know what it is or, you, you know, don't, you know, are not sure what it is, you know, ask someone. You can take samples by, uh, by Ken's office or you can bring him uh, to uh, the Bruton station and somehow get images to us. You can email them to us, take a picture of it, email it to us. We can identify it and that will actually help you because, you know, knowing what the uh, weak cycles are, uh, are in the life cycle or what the vulnerable cycles are for pesticides uh, in that life cycle is going to be very, very important. Okay? There are several uh, problems. Cultural practices uh, can be a problem in your landscape and we'll talk about each one of these. Insect damage, uh, disease pressure, environmental factors, all of these things cause you problems. And, you know, identifying which one of these, you know, uh, is probably going to be key, but also cultural practices, you know, those are things that we can control. You know, insect damage, disease pressure, environmental, we can't control them, but we can actually kind of manage those things and keep them reduced. Okay? Now, Bo talked about the planting, cultural practices, planting too deep. That is a big no no. I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, too much water or not enough water. You know, we talk a lot about overwatering and not worry, you know, all those things factor in, you know, and you can dig the perfect hole, but if you dig that perfect hole, my name is James Miles, I used to be a post hole digger, you know, when you plant a plant with a post hole digger, if you were good like I was, you can get the side of that hole pretty slick, okay? You can get it pretty slick, if you get it pretty slick, what have you done? Just created a pot in the hole, I mean a pot in the ground, okay? That plant will sit there in that much water if you overwater. Okay, so all those things, you know, add into the uh, decline of, of uh, plants. Uh, over uh, or under fertilizing. That first year, you know, Ball talked about putting a little bit of fertilizer in, you know, the, the first year. My rule is no fertilizer. The reason I say no fertilizer is if I tell you two tablespoons, what are you going to do? Be honest with me. Or, how about a cup? Okay, you create more damage. Okay. Exactly, more is better, okay? So you gotta create more damage. That first year, the only thing we really wanna do is put on good root systems, get the tree established. If we load it up with fertilizer, we're gonna actually burn some roots, and Bo talked about putting on too much top growth and not being able to support it with the root system. So first year, no fertilizer, but once we get beyond that first year, we can start fertilizing, but make sure we don't over fertilize, okay? Improper mulching, Bo talked about that. Some of you guys gave yourself away. <laughs> you know, improper mulching, that's a big, big deal, okay? The tree volcanoes, we need to do away with that, okay? We're going to talk about some common insect problems. And inspecting those plants, looking for the uh, different types of uh, signs and symptoms. One of the first ones is the black sooty mold, you know? You see the black sooty mold, whether it's a tree, whether it's a bedding plant, whether it's whatever it is, People want to do something about the black sooty mold, but that's not the problem, okay? You can flake that stuff off with your fingernail, you know? When you look a little closer, turn that leaf over, and you may even see aphids, you may see scale, you may see a number of things. So look beyond just that one thing, and, and we'll see the cause, okay? And, uh, aphids, very common. You know, there's a lot of natural enemies there, so if I see one or two, or maybe even five or ten on the plant, I'm not going to push the panic button because the population's got to build up a little bit so the beneficials can move in. So I'll let them kind of ride a little bit. Now, once I see the population start getting up, you know, 20, 30, 50, 
then it's time to get the big guns out. You know, you can use um, um, safer soap, ultrafine oils, those things like that. Uh, if you really have a plant that's really eat up with it, you got, you know, fire ants working on them and all that kind of stuff, then you may have to get up with some of the insecticides, some of the systemics, uh, jump up. But again, uh, it's easier to get control of these if you're monitoring, you know. If all of a sudden now the whole plant's eat up with it, you know, uh, a good example would be, um, both talked about uh, the river birch. You know, river birch will get some aphid and some mite populations on them and they'll explode overnight. Know, and it'll do some funny things to them. Well, once you get to that point, you know, safer soap, ultrafine oil, you know, those are not going to keep up with it. You got to really get the big guns out and get some heavier insecticides. Okay, white flies. You'll see a lot of white flies, especially in the dry time of the year. And they, the drier, hotter, drier, the worse these guys are. Okay, and they like a whole lot of things in the landscape. You know, you'll see them on trees, you'll see them on bedding plants, annuals. Uh, all sorts of things. Uh, the weakness uh, in, in trying to get these guys under control is one stage of the life cycle, they actually are just like a scale, so they're kind of hard to kill. Okay, So you have to stay on top of it. And none of these uh, insects that we're talking about are going to have a silver bullet. There's not going to be a one-shot deal. Okay, You have to do some repeat treatments, going to have to do multiple uh, type of techniques to uh, get them under control. So uh, using some insecticides, things like that. But first of all, identifying that you have a problem with them. And you see, you get that bad, you know, you may even have to prune some of that stuff out. Okay. Uh, watch for your beneficials. They will work on them a little bit. Uh, ultrafine oils at that interval, the 10-day interval works. Uh, insecticide soaps work. But then you have your standard mouth on. Uh, Bifenthrin is a fairly new product. And then the acephate, which has been around for a while. Those are all good uh, insecticides to use for uh, white flies. But again, it's not going to be a one shot deal. You have to do several treatments on those. Okay? Scale is probably the number one problem we're going to have with a lot of our plants in the landscape. But this is when you buy. They don't fly, they don't crawl. I mean, you buy them on the plant, okay? Most of the time. Um, when they get this bad and your stem is heat up with them, the leaves are actually in the patio, it's time to replace that plant. You're not going to win that battle. You're going to spend way more money than that plant's worth uh, trying to get that population under control. Okay? Um, but uh, they're personally sucking insect. This time of year, the eggs will hatch. You'll have a crawler stage. You have to have a magnifying glass to see them. Once you see them in the crawler stage, you can actually get those guys pretty easy with insecticide soaps, oils, things like that. But once they become adults, and they uh, attach and get sed uh, sed sedentary uh, on the uh, plant, they are very, very hard to kill, okay? It's hard to uh, get a, a good product on them now to take care of them. Ultrafine oil, soaps, pruning, heavy populations. Uh, if it's a, a plant, and it, uh, a, say a woody plant, and there's one stem that's that bad, but the rest of the stems look pretty good, just prune that population off and you're ahead of the game. Okay, so you can use some pruning techniques. Standard insecticides, which we mentioned before. Uh, systemics, there's a, uh, for homeowners and some of the municipal sites, um, admitted cloprin is fairly new to that, uh, that, in, that part of the industry. It's a systemic, uh, you actually pour it around the plant and it takes it up through the root system and it kills piercing and sucking insects. It doesn't do anything for caterpillars or beetles or things like that. Um, smaller plants is very effective. You get large trees, it's not as effective um, on uh, some of the insect pests. If you have um, azaleas and um, lantana, you'll see this kind of a stippling or ashy look to the plant. Uh, those are from lace bugs. Uh, you turn the leaf over and you'll see these guys or maybe the immatures, they're actually sucking the juice out of the plant um, and causing that stippling damage. Um, watch for your beneficials. If you don't have any beneficials present, then you can step up to insecticide soaps and oils again, your standard products. But the key, May, June, July, not so much treatment, will get them under control. Okay. Uh, usually you plant these plants, you have these plants, they leaf out, they look great for about two or three months, and then by the middle of summer they start looking bad. So that's going to be the key, is timing. 
uh, mites. You also get the same sort of stippling uh, that we saw here uh, with mites. So that's why it's important to actually turn that leaf over and look and see what type of plants we have, I mean, pests we have. And uh, you'll see, you know, the populations here. Uh, again, watch for your natural enemies. And you can usually wash a small population off with a good stream of water. Uh, as population builds, you have to step up to your uh, insecticidal soaps and your horticulture oils again. Uh, and those work very well. If the population really gets out of hand, you want to step up to some of the traditional insecticides, you can do that as well. Uh, caterpillars, there's a lot of different caterpillars out there uh, that feed on a variety of, of, uh, of our ornamentals. Um, People are really, you know, excited about butterfly gardens. Well, if you have butterfly beds and butterfly gardens, what are you going to have? Caterpillars. Caterpillars. So you got, you got to have both. Okay. So what you're going to need to do is actually have your caterpillar plants somewhere where you're not worried about what they look like, and your butterflies are going to your nectar-loving plants. So understanding, you know, that you need to have both of those is, is very good. Also, whoever's working with you. Or, that kind of thing, realize that on our caterpillar plants, we don't want to kill those caterpillars. But on our desirable plants, we might want to attack those. Okay? Um, watch for your beneficials, your wasp birds, uh, parasites, uh, stink bugs, big out bugs, lizards, uh, and one of my favorites not listed on there is fire ants and wasp, uh, well, wasp are on there, but fire ants also eat caterpillars. Okay? You can remove them by hand. There's some sprays and some powders. The BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, and Spinosad are very effective on caterpillars when they're small. The limitation with BT and Spinosad, though, is uh, in the middle of the summer when it was real hot and dry, that bacteria will sit on the uh, surface of the plant and actually die. It won't get a chance to actually work for you. So if you're going to do it, do it early in the season when the worms are still small and we have sort of a mild temperature. Once we get real hot and dry, you know, you're not going to get the bang for your buck with those products then. Uh, seven works well and then bifenthrin uh, works very well. Let's look at some traffic problems. I mean, this is uh, participatory. What's the problem with these? It's pretty good design here, but what's the problem? Fire ant bed, fire ants is, is a problem, that's correct. Uh, the other thing is, if you you got a weedy, that's a time. If they would make that bed a little bit, you know, wider at an angle, that's a little bit easier for that lawnmower to get, get around there. That's man hours that you can save. Okay. What's the problem here? Is there a problem? <laughs> yeah, traffic problem. Yeah, traffic problem right there. Okay. <laughs> now, here's here's the thing. There's two schools of thought with traffic problems. <laughs> you can either fight it and lose it, or you can work with it. Okay. In this situation, you're not going to win now. At a playground, something like that, you're not going to win it. You need to work with it. Okay. So using some sort of a mulch pathway, doing something to work with that. If you put if you, even if you extended that bed and put uh, knockout roses there, what are those knockout roses going to look like in about three weeks? They're going to be knocked out. They're going to be trampled down. Okay. So what you need to do is work with some of those traffic problems. Okay. And, th and that traffic problem is also going to create a compaction problem. So even if you put plants next to those areas, you're going to have some compaction issues, some erosion issues. So uh, it's going to be very important not to try to fight those things. The shade issues, uh, Bo talked about how big should your mulch areas be. There's no rule of thumb, but what I would be looking at is also working with shade around those, uh, well, mulching around those shade areas so that you're not fighting trying to get plants to grow there, you know. Once you get the mulch areas in there and you want to go in there and put a few shade-loving plants in, that's fine. But again, watch for your traffic problems, okay, because you're going to have some. Okay. That looks pretty good. You know, it keeps the lawnmowers and the weed ears around, out from around the plants. And actually, you can you also, once you know, if you have a larger plant here, if you need to tie off to those, you can do that too. If you got one plant that's like that, it's pretty good. Not a bad idea. 
But if you got a hundred, you know, somebody's going to be weaving, you know, through that stuff with a lawnmower. You know, it's going to be a management nightmare. That's what I'm getting at. So what was that? It's more <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, there's some problems. I mean, it looks good if you just got one, but once you start adding plants to it, so instead of having these little, you know, connect the dot things, what you may want to do is consider doing a large bed, large planter, okay? Instead of having individual plants kind of stuck out there like that. Uh, so that you don't have any management problems, okay? What's the problem here? Man hours, weed eating, right there. Also, man hour weed eating, plant uh, injury because that weed eater getting up against there too. Okay, so mulching around that and actually, you know, being, I like the design, you know, the, uh, not necessarily the design, but the fact that it's breaking up, it's not just uh, monotonous. You know, you've got a, you know, a crepe burrow here, and you know, it, can, it can be expanded, it can, you know, be improved on, but at least it's not just one line of one particular plant, okay? So uh, make sure you mulch and eliminate some of those uh, man hours. Same thing here, you know, when you commit to an area, commit to it wholeheartedly, manage for it, think long term, okay? Instead of just having this little, even if they mulch in here, you've still got to, you know, get in here with a weed eater to get that little corner. So make sure that you, it flows for the equipment, the size of the equipment.